Hello, everybody. We'll be getting started in a minute or so. Welcome wherever you are calling in from. Well, welcome everyone. So I'm so glad you're joining us from wherever you're calling in from to listen to our two luminaries speak together today. My name is Tim McKee and I'm the publisher at North Atlantic Books, a nonprofit independent book publisher based in California. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm coming calling in from Ohlone land and I wanted to appreciate the ongoing rematriation efforts that are happening around me. Um, in my neck of the woods, it's led by the Segura Te Land Trust, and um, we pay a Shumi land tax uh, to support their rematriation efforts. And fortunately, there are many such organizations around the world now, so I encourage you to find your local one. And wow, I feel honored to be here with Bio and Camille. And I'm going to introduce them, and then I'm going to pop off and let them do their thing and for about an hour, and then I'll come back on for the last half an hour or so and um, ask them questions that you all have put in the chat. So um, if you have a question you would love to have answered that occurs to you, you can put it in the chat. We're monitoring those, and we'll gather them together uh, for that last portion. So on to our guest. Camille Sapara Barton is a social imagineer, artist and somatic practitioner dedicated to creating networks of care and livable futures. Rooted in black feminism, ecology and harm reduction, Camille uses creativity alongside embodied practices to create culture change in fields ranging from psychedelic assisted therapies to arts education. Their debut book, which we were so honored to publish, is called Tending Grief, Embodied Rituals for Holding Our Sorrow and Growing Cultures of Care in Community. It came out in April 2024 by North Atlantic Books. And bio, you know, there's like these long bios of bio. And I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna freewheel this one a little bit. Um, we've known each other for about 10 years. Um, we worked on his debut book, uh, These Wilds Beyond Our Fences, um, which many people have read at this point. It's been like a slow storm that has passed around the world. Um, I know he would want me to say first and foremost that he is the husband of EJ and the father of Alethea and Kaya. Hopefully he will speak more about that. And, um, you know, he's met my child. He's been at my house. Uh, we give each other deep embraces. And uh, gosh, the way I would sum up by Okomalafe is he is a disorderer of patterns. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Camille. Thank you. Hi, Bio. Hello, Camille. How are you? It's good mm. to meet you. It's good to be with you. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I'm tender right now. I know. I know. Um, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm tender. I am navigating some grief. Mm -hmm. My sister, who is the, the real matriarch of my family, she died over the weekend. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm moving through the waves right. of grief, um, but also feeling a lot of presence and wonder, lots of different emotions. Um, and I sat with whether I wanted to still have this conversation, if it felt like the right thing. And I kept on 
getting a yes, this is the right thing. So I'm showing up in my tenderness and I'm excited to yeah, be with what's here and exchange and what ways feel right for today. Mm -hmm. Well, I greet you, Camille. And I got the message about your loss um, just this morning. And I sent a message just to say that I am feeling with you and and I want to speak with your tenderness. I want to be here in the tenderness of this moment. And maybe maybe that's what it means to be in this in these times of pain and loss and grief is that we need a politics of tenderness, a way to to meet each other in ways that do not reinscribe the brace, you know, the ways that we are coached into resisting the waves of grief. And, and grief is decolonial. Grief is, grief is potentially emancipatory. Mm. So, I sit here with you, sibling. Mm. Thank you. Yes. How would you like us to begin? And I greet Tim, by the way. And and I hope my, my dear son Mandela is doing well there. And my sister as well. They are. Thank you. How do we um, begin? I mean, I feel like you've already spoken to something that I think is very uh, a core thread for both of us, the kind of potential liberatory nature of grief. Right. And I want to hear more about how that moves for you and anything you'd want to share about how you came to that, that sense of the need to grieve in order to repattern away from what we're currently swimming in. As we celebrate your book, Camille. Um, you know, I think back to the days of my initial training as a clinical psychologist. I was working in the Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital in Enugu, which is a state in eastern in the eastern part of Nigeria. One of the few neuropsychiatric hospitals functional to serve about 200 million black bodies. Um, I remember feeling at odds with the details, the threads of my profession. It seemed like I was taking up the vocation of putting people back together again, if you know what I mean. And I wondered about the about the hidden and often unspoken gifts of falling apart. And there are stories I can tell that I'm that I will work myself into. Um, I, I've just arrived from um, a different country, so I'm I'm still feeling out of whack. So forgive me. Um, but yes, I I remember feeling this this juncture, this rupture, like I had chosen the healing profession and yet my intervention seemed to be increasingly political, mm -hmm. increasingly devoted to the obscuration of other kinds of realities and possibilities. And I wondered about the politics of clinical psychology, the politics of therapeutic intervention. Um, and this is, this is what brings me to a place in my work where I notice the shapes of our experience. That is, I often tell people that whiteness isn't even a color. Whiteness is a shape. Yeah. It's a posture. The ways that our bodies are postured in modernity, the way that we are framed, the ways that we brace against the heat of a world that is beyond settlement, the ways that we make sense of the next, of the future, of each other, 
the ways that we police each other, the ways that we act for resolution, the ways that we speak truth to power, all these are not individual experiences. There are tendencies within a system. They are literally geometrical shapes um, of experience. And I think there's something about grief that corrodes that posture, that invites bodies into a fetal position, that, that draws us closer to the planet, to the earth, that wets our eyes and relieves us of the burdens of clarity, you know, and our addictions to data. There's something about grief that signals the possibilities of uh, what this French philosopher Deleuze will call a line of flight, taking us away from settlement and its patterns of repetition. And not that I want to romanticize grief. It is not some elixir, but there's something about its visitation that is antithetical to the rectilinearity of modern postures. It's not there for now. Thank you. I deeply resonate. Mm. I deeply resonate. And for me, as someone that has family members who have been incredibly shaped by, harmed by the Western med mental health system in the UK, mm -hmm. you feel like some of, some of the things I've seen have also brought me to this conclusion around methods for healing in these institutions and what gets left out, what gets left behind and what dimensions are welcome and what has to be severed. And I think when it comes to what we think of as mental health, I think there's yeah. a whole spiritual component that is erased. Um, I think for my family members, there were definitely spiritual visitations, parts of their experience that were um not acknowledged as being real not right, right. Welcomed. and as a result there was another severing in even trying to engage with the system which they were being coerced into because you have your right. autonomy taken away and yes. in very many ways it's like it's incarceration yes and yet you can't come in your wholeness and so much of that is linked to assimilation and the the experience of colonization and um I think, yeah, these these stories in my family definitely have led me on this process of wanting to understand uh, pre-colonial Yoruba approaches mm. to mental health, right? Because that's part of my lineage too. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I know that people like Maladoma Somme would write when he was alive about, you know, shamanic approaches within the Dagara cosmology yes. uh, to treat what we call schizophrenia in the West. Um, and he was kind of a bit of a beacon of light in a way of some other possibility. It hasn't um, landed as reality in the experiences of the family members I talk about yet, but just to know, oh, there are other pathways. What could these be? What would it look like if, or, if the, the wholeness was welcome here and healing was rooted in that as opposed to this kind of control and this box that you have mm -hmm. to be in otherwise mm. you were you were wrong and you were deserving of everything that's happening to you feels like the logic of that mm. So, mm. and there's so much grief that comes from that and it's not easily resolved or neat and tidy or even often acknowledged as grief because the person's alive right so what are you what are you upset about and yeah i think there is something about loss of control that is really suppressed under whiteness and in the logics of the West as they as it currently exists. Um, there is such a, an attempt to, to understand, to know, to hold in place. And so anything that means that we relinquish control, that we lose control of our body, that we enter states that are altered in some way that we might right. wail, we might sob, we might trem trem tremble, tremor, are oh, like, no, this is bad. We have to mm -hmm. control this. We have to suppress this. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I sense that as part of why 
grief at the moment is still quite a taboo. Even we are in this moment where people are talking about it. There's a lot of talking about it. Yes. But in terms of practicing it and feeling comfortable about going into the states where we allow the wave to come <laughs> and we surrender and we see where it takes us because we don't know, but we allow. Like there's a whole remembering, I think, that we need to do there. Those of us assimilated into Western cultures, ways of being, ways of thinking, to kind of reclaim and befriend that process. Yes. Generativity in it. And I'm hoping that that my book can be a contribution to that in some way. Indeed. Indeed. Um, yeah. I feel like there's a lot, a lot of grief tending to do. Yes. 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 That is so profound to say. And, you know, Camille, you know, the, um, what you say about grief tending and the work that is invited here, you know, it gestures towards this very important idea that I think is carried in your book as well. Um, I'm framing it in this way that grief isn't, isn't just sadness. It's, it's not, it's not a feeling, an occasional feeling. Grief is research, right? It is invitational, as we have said, it is, it hints at a different kind of politics. Um, it is research because I feel there, there's something here there's some kind of queer agency here that invites us to investigate loss, mm. right? And as you have said so eloquently, white modernity, which is not reducible to white skinned individuals, you know, that phenotypic addiction, uh, you know, to visual traits isn't, how whiteness turns. Whiteness is, is neurotypical unassailability. It is how um, the world is terraformed after a racializing economic um, civilizational principle. Um, and it's, its work is, the work of this principle is almost theological. In, uh, it, there are two traditions in the Christian the evolution of the Christian tradition. Um, of course, there are many more, but in this sense, there were two, the cataphatic and the apophatic. The cataphatic people, folks, were quite fascinated with speaking what God is, right? Mm -hmm. God is this and God is that. Um, God is good or God is bad, whatever. Whatever positive statements were made about the sacred were in the tradition of the, cataf uh, the cataphatic explorations. But the apophatic folks um, felt that the more you say, the less you're connected to the, the nature of the sacred. So apophatic literally means unspeakable, not saying, I will not say. The apophatic is a ghost that haunts modernity. This mm. unsayability that haunts, it's, it's the loss of speakability. It's where, as you have said, where we are unable to put a handle on it. Is that the American expression? I, 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 I guess so. <laughs> it's, it's where we're able to, to, to name it or to, to, to resolve it, to finalize it, where it, in, the, in the moment we want to claim it or give it a name, to archive it, uh, put it in a taxonomy, you know, categorize it, put it under a headline, it slips away fugitively from our grasp. And I think that that is what the decolonial feels like, like the cracks in the settlement that we've built around ourselves and with our bodies. And this is how Greek, um, I said Greek, grief, also Greek, but this is how grief connects as the deterritorialization of settlement, as the upsetting of our claims to centrality, right? 
it's investigation. It is research. It is planetary research. It is ecological research. It's not just having a tear in your eye. It is, I feel, a sonorous call to these times for us to engage in some kind of strange, terraforming, undoing research. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, I very much agree. And what popped into my mind when you were just speaking then was around, you know, I know in, in theory at the moment and in my own research, like I'm very interested in how we can connect with the more than human um, and what that looks like to, to re repattern the severing. Right. right. Uh, and I'm in baby stages of that because I'm very much shaped by swimming in, you know, growing up in part of empire in England. So it's a slow process. Um, but one thing that I've been noticing is thinking about consent, what it means to have consent with beings that we don't know how to communicate with in words. And I recently went to a really brilliant workshop by a practitioner who inspires me a lot. Um, one of these cool people who was not on social media at all. <laughs> they exist. <laughs> They're out there. <laughs> Successful artists can exist without social media. <laughs> they are they are proof of this. Um, they do a lot of embodied consent work. And I went to one of their sessions recently and they were talking about the etymology of consent and that it means sensing together. And it got me thinking or feeling, and like what does it mean to sense together if we can't if most of us in the West or under Western modernity can't actually sense ourselves, mm -hmm. like what, what does that mean then? Um, and I feel that my interest in both grief tending and somatics are both, are both pathways, not the only ones, but pathways that can support that sensing. That's that homecoming of sensing in the body in relation to the environment that we're entangled with that can yes. then really lead to more collaboration, more consent with the more than human, more um, joyful and intentional entanglement. Um, yes. Hopefully start to uproot this idea of the solo individual dominant. Yes, individual. yes, yes. Um, and I don't see grief tending as a kind of goal in and of itself, but I'm interested in what it can do relationally. Yes. Um, in that way, but also in thinking about ancestral connection and wisdom yes. and kind of epigenetics of it all, of like how it can be a guiding force for yes. learning, reflecting on the, the ancestral uh, patterns and things we've inherited but as a way to maybe reflect and as you often say, slow down. And yes. all, okay, given this, where do I want to go now? How do I want to move now? Um, and so it's not that I think we should be in grief all the time or that it's just this like you're saying this elixir it's more like what can it do what mm -hmm. does it really and how can that become a map or a, an exploration to move somewhere beautiful else? beautiful beautiful you know what you say about consent is is um is doing beautiful things in my in my body um because I feel one of the operations of the modern is to, um, at least two of these operations, it, it's to kind of reduce this sensing together to a legal artifact, right? Uh, it, 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 it first takes this poetics of relations, in the words of Edouard Glisson, it takes this apophatic, ecstatic, you know, non-representational, more than human sensing together and reduces it into a category. And then it presumes that the individual comes before consent. So it, it, it already presumes a body and then consent comes afterwards. In an animistic ecological, Yoruba indigenous inspired cosmology. 
um, consent comes before the body. Not as a legal artifact, but it's a sensing together that our bodies are not resolved, right? It's not, it's not an agreement that comes afterwards. It's not asking for permission that comes afterwards. It's that this sensing together is the ongoing fabric from which our bodies are continually stitched, right? There's, so there's an ongoingness to it, but that is lost in the uh, juridical, civilizational, settlement building work of white modernity that presumes that bodies are already finalized and then we can meet each other. Whereas there is this feminist, new materialist, post-humanist, you know, invitation to consider that our bodies are, have never been still, that we are traveling, that we are diasporic, that we are moving along. But the only other way to come to this sense of being at large is through loss, right? This is the reason why I feel the most powerful vocations of our time, you know, the most electrifying work of our time is to introduce us to ourselves, the, the fluid relationalities that have not yet been introduced to us, that is cut off in the, in the surgical effort to make us still, to render us individuated in a final way. So I, 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 I really feel that this grief tending that you're inviting us to is the shape of the decolonial. It is, it is Toni Morrison's um, invitation to travel, to, to, to leave those plantations behind. It is fugitivity. It is learning to listen. It is making sanctuary. It has no guarantee. It's not a guarantee of utopia. You know, it's like, this is the, the point where you arrive. Instead, it's the process. It's always process. It's never product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I wonder about your Yoruba lineage, because I was looking at your name, the, the <laughs> Sapara. I was wondering, is that a Yoruba? Should I ask? Of course, I would ask him Nigerian. We ask all the time. But tell me more about that, if you don't mind. Yes. Um, yes, Sapara is my is my Yoruba name. Um, <laughs> and I have some interesting ancestors um, who... Mm. Yeah, I feel very connected to one in particular uh, called Oguntola Shapara. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and he had a role in, I guess, reintroducing plant medicine into Nigeria after it was banned by the British colonial powers. Wow. He was only able to do that because he became a Western trained doctor. So he trained yes. in Edinburgh University in the 1800s. He was the eighth, I think, Western trained Nigerian doctor mm -hmm. so it's an interesting one of kind of being in this position of kind of the colonial yoruba elite in some yes, way yes, yes. using that to then subvert um and so i feel very connected to organzola um and i wonder if my own plant medicine leanings are coming through there and I've only been to Nigeria once, so I have to go back to research more. I know he was, yeah, he was doing interesting things. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's some that's some of my family, and um, yeah. <laughs> you need to come two, three times. Take some jollof rice and eba and pounded yam and egusi soup, and then you're fully in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I already love Igusi, though. I love Igusi. Good, 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 <laughs> good. Um, there's a lot to be said about that. I, I, I did some work at the uh, in Ogun State before I moved to the eastern part of Nigeria. It's called the Aro Mental Health Mental um, Neuropsychiatric Hospital, and the person who founded it, whose name escapes me at this moment, but I can forgive myself because I'm still landing. Um, 
uh, was the first person to earn a degree in psychology or psychiatry in Nigeria and who was trained in the West as well. But he came back to Nigeria and, um, and decided to start this hospital by integrating um, Babalao's works, you know, the indigenous approaches and with the Western approaches. And he, he just kind of created this alchemical mix, um, which I believe in my opinion is, you know, increasingly problematic today mm. because inclusion can often become capture, right? It's just, we will take your methods and we will fit it within our algorithms. And then something is lost in that way. Um, but there is a lot to be said about these times and what Yoruba uh, cosmovisions offer these moments. Mm -hmm. um, one is that we're not alone and have never been alone. And that in the words of in the traditions of Ishu, the trickster, it is often in our being spirited away that we meet ourselves for the first time. That speaks to grief in a very powerful way. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and that relationship to our ancestors and where we come from. Um, I think for me, building a relationship with the dead um, is very important for my grief tending work. Good. Trying to, uh, I suppose I don't. I don't hold it against people at all. The way that people in the West try and comfort when someone dies, I'm very touched yeah. by all the messages and sweet, sweet offerings of care that have been coming. Yes. My way. Yes. And also, there is something so baked into the idea that okay, they're gone now. That's it. Sorry for your mm -hmm. loss. Mm -hmm. and me, it's, it's not it's not it's not how it works it's you know if I'm inviting people to care for me in this time then I'm like oh please help my grandmother to transition to the ancestral realm mm -hmm. to feel where she is and I know mm -hmm. that it's not a question of oh she's in a better place and I'm here it's like okay now our relationship is changing mm -hmm. we need her in a different way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that gives me connection and rootedness in a way that's beyond this idea of the beings are here and then they're gone and that's it. And I wonder how that would change the way we think about social change, the way we think yes. about repatterning the harmful ways of being that are so prevalent in this time. Yes. If we had that anchoring of knowing, as you say, we're not alone. It's yes. not just what we see with our eyes. Yeah. There's this whole lineage we can call upon behind us mm. uh, and maybe for some as well in front of us in linear ideas of time and I think that gives me a lot of rooting and it's not to say I'm not feeling a lot of sorrow there's a lot moving for me but yes. I am clear that I get to keep the relationship the relationship has changed but I keep the relationship um and yeah, have to keep on honoring the dead and then they, they honor us. Mm -hmm. And it can be this reciprocal relationship. Um, and it just makes me think a lot of, of Haiti, you know, Haitian revolution and how connected to the ancestors that is, you know, it's often mm -hmm. cited again in the kind of legal policy subtext, but what many yeah. miss is that ritual component, is that ancestral rooted component that right. I think incredibly important um and you know one can't force anyone to believe in spirit or have or have a no material but I do kind of hope and I'm nudging lovingly nudging uh my kin that are involved in activism social change of any kind to um to root in something beyond just mm. the just what we can see because I think I think that can give a tremendous amount of guidance and support with the unknown. Mm. Mm. I share, I share, I share to that. I have a question for you, Camille. 
What is the most dangerous thesis of your book? <laughs> that is barely articulated, faintly um, into that, but is probably so commodious, so large that it needs um, the kind of tending that spills past the boundaries of the book. What is the most dangerous thing that the book offers? Wow. Uh, ooh, this is a spicy question, and I'm going to have to think. Spicy, it. like Joe <laughs> from us. Um, what is the most dangerous thesis? Hmm. Can I ask a clarification, a point of clarification? You you can call a friend. <laughs> and you can do 50-50 or something. What's the other option? Yes, you have three options. <laughs> you mean dangerous towards Babylon or dangerous like for misinterpretation that could be like potentially harmful for people no. to engage? I, I mean, I think I mean dangerous in in terms of um, disruption, in mm -hmm. it, it 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 upsets the myth making normativities that we're already and you know engaged in as bodies in modernity. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah. Um, I would say the most dangerous thesis is probably then this idea that grief is not just about bereavement mm -hmm. um, that there are many 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 things we can grieve and that I would invite people to grieve and to trust in the generativity of that um, I think that is quite disruptive in and of that even with bereavement which is kind of validated as you know the thing you can really grieve Right. I mean, in the West, right. we'll get two days, two days of bereavement leave. Uh, I don't know how much better it is in Europe. I haven't asked my family members at the moment um, who are trying to get time off work. I think some are actually taking holiday time, but I don't. I don't think it's much better in Europe necessarily, unless you work mm. with a company. Mm. It's this hierarchy of who you're meant to be able to grieve. Is it an yeah. immediate member? You know, mm -hmm. If it's a cousin, oh, well, that's, you're not really meant to grieve them. Or if it's someone who's chosen family, mm -hmm. oh, no, we get time off. And then there's the question of animal kin, right? The relationships people have there, but also just to eco side, you know, the, the mm -hmm. ways many of us feel um, with the changes that we're witnessing and sensing and exposed to in our own shifting health realities, because we are so entangled with everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think this this idea that we'd give ourselves permission to grieve and that we could benefit from being in conversation with the loss, the intergenerational losses, the things that we carry, um, I think it upsets this notion that we just need to be productive workers and move away from any states that shift us out of that just go yeah. go go gene like orientation right and right. i think why we see in the most recent version of the dsm they've got this there you go one year grief disorder mm -hmm. you're going to more than a year and it affects your ability <laughs> to work then oh you have prolonged grief disorder and we now yeah. need to apologize you or, med or medicate you whatever it is um and so yeah, I think that's probably one of the the, the most dangerous. <laughs> High five. <laughs> yes, I and I think that is beautifully stated. The spirit that travels and lifts your book. Uh, I would add to this, um, and I, I, I sense it in your voice as well and in your story that 
and this is particular particularly um strong and important to say given the kinds of world situations we're in right now the wars in the middle east the pain of incredible loss in in gaza in the west bank the the wars on the African continent. I don't know if you know this, but you know, Nigerian Nigerians were in their hundreds of thousands and potentially millions on the streets in the month of August, protesting intolerable conditions of poverty and and hunger and climate loss and the the vicissitudes of of suffering as a result of ge geological shifts and geographical um, migrations and migratudes, it seems like grief is a thematic staple of these moments. And it calls into question for me, the identity of the griever, mm. right? There is, Again, this is, I think, a modern intervention. The griever is the self that I'm seeing right here. The, the griever is the monolith, the anthropomorphic shape. Mm. I don't know that that is particularly complete. Not that I have anything complete to offer, but it's radically incomplete to suggest that we humans are the ones doing the grieving. I think grief is ecological. Mm -hmm. So that in a sense, it's not even my grief versus your grief. Maybe in a sense, the syncopating lines of, you know, becoming that flows through our planet, through what we rudely call reality. Maybe those syncopating lines suggest that when a will loses her child, that her grief is mine in some way, that, that when a leaf waltz to the earth in fall, that the grief of a fallen leaf is mine, that we sense this in some way, that we are participating in a parliament of grieving together, right? Of touching loss in a way that will never be contained, but that our modern fright is to build ramparts and walls to protect ourselves from the interrogation of external grief because we, we cannot stand it. It's too much. It's a ritornello. It's, a, it's repetition so that we can shield ourselves from that because it's so invasive and terrifying to settlement that we actually live through each other that our bodies are transcorporeal, that we live within, in the spaces between, and not isol in a, some isolated way. So, mm -hmm. so your vocation of grief tending is literally touching the corpus callosum that, you know, entwines our bodies together. It's not even a matter of, I'm going to be entangled. It's that we are already entangled. And the griever is an ecology. It's the forest that grieves, not the tree. Mm -hmm. I resonate deeply. I'm one of uh, many people in this time. I think of Sophie Strand as one of them, the people mm. who compost right now. Dear sister. Mm -hmm. Composting grief in the ways, as you say, a forest or an ecology, everything will break down to then nurture the web of life again things will bloom decay recycle nurture and yes. i think whether we're doing it in this on the so-called individual level or if we're doing it in group or if it's happening in the forest i think that is just part of the life cycle it's just whether or not we are choosing to participate in the life cycle and go with that flow or if in mm there is the suppression and the trying to keep out and mm -hmm. the and the willful uh 
lack of participation in the cycle that is already happening, that we're already entangled in, which is whether or not we lean into that flow and allow it to shapeshift us, allow it to transform us. Yeah. We can be more in alignment. But I agree with you. I think there is a, a way that Western psychology still frames grief you know like everyone grieves in different ways and and i'm not i'm not coming for that people have their <laughs> and if, and if, they, if that's a helpful frame cool but for me i definitely do lean more to this kind of collective yeah life cycle seasonal approach um that is personally what makes more sense to me yes yes and when i feel the quality of this grief so far you know less than a week into it when I feel the quality of this compared to the loss I experienced of a friend earlier this year, mm. there's so much I'm learning or kind of, I guess, researching, excavating by being with it that I think is coming as a result of the relationality between me and my grandmother, the mm. ways I participate in the blessing of her body, being with her body after transition. That's mm. giving me peace, a lot of anchoring, the ways that I chose to move closer to her and even through difficulty, be in connection meet what was possible i felt like i've done what i could in service of the relationship and i'll continue to as she transitions and the way my grief is as a re as a result of that it's very different than other forms i've experienced and yes it's going to be different every time but it's it's definitely giving me something around the relationality yes and how that then impacts the process, the experience. Because I feel held in the wave, I feel held in the flow because I've been in alignment with that relationship. Right. Um, so there's something there that's forming for me. It's not complete, but um, but yeah, I think it's more akin to a forest. And hopefully we'll get we'll get to that place again. But I do think there needs to be a bit of a bridging, perhaps between where we find ourselves in modernity and the lack of capacity to sense the pervasive numbing that many of us do to kind of move through and survive late stage capitalism. I think there's some bridging necessary before kind of going more towards, let's say, Dagara communal style, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. choice, which I've participated in and a beautiful, mm -hmm. but I think because there's so much of a orientation towards peak experience, in the West and leaving the body and just blasting out. I think that maybe something that cultivates sensing into and almost titrating, as my friend Farzana would say, titrating grief. It was like dipping into it intentionally, feeling, noticing, then coming out again to mm -hmm. build that capacity to actually be with it without having to just leave. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's right to leave, but to have more choice. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's something there that would be supportive so we can get back into the kind of collective forest experience. Of, of grief as a wave um yeah those are some current noticings <laughs> beautiful 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 i'm i'm in deep appreciation for what this book might do and hopefully will do in these moments of pain and questions um i don't think we can afford to to cure ourselves from grieving, right? I don't think we can afford to do that now. I think that there is a sensuous solidarity that is summoned in grieving together. And it is my prayer that this book travels and it reaches hands and feet and bodies and lives and communities where it is most needed mm. and and that people who are with us in this conversation listening to us that in that very soft and tender place that is um swirling that you haven't shared yet but the place where you feel most tender like my dear sibling here that you will be touched and that you'll be reminded through your participation in the vortex of this beautiful publication. You will be reminded that you're not alone. You've never been alone. And your grief is not fully yours. It cannot be fully yours. You must 
seed it into a world that proliferates in the generosity of our falling together. Um, I'm not sure what else to say except to say Asher. Asher, Asher. Curious, very curious to see how this is all going to unfold. But yeah, we're certainly living in interesting times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. indeed. Okay, I think this is the part where we take questions. Um, yeah, we've got some great ones that have come in. Tim, you're still there. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I wow, I've really just <laughs> been leaning into everything you've been sharing and have felt felt it in my whole whole being. So thank you, both of you. There's some great questions. Um so I'll start with one here. Um I hear this word fugitivity coming up with various teachers. But I don't know what it actually means. Would you mind speaking on fugitivity a bit more? Okay, I think I, I can take that. <clears throat> and Camille, if you want to say something to that as well, please. Um, it's just like the term whiteness. I, I've been um, pilloried for using it um, often and I get I get um people very well intentioned folk you know writing to me and saying Baya can't you just use another term instead of whiteness and I often tell people that you know of course every term comes with its limitations and there are risks with using whiteness especially the identitarian risks um, but the but the the analysis here is steeped in black studies, right? And it has a prestigious legacy in decolonial liberation theologies and explorations of um, um, coloniality. Um, so I accept those risks. Fugitivity comes along from black studies as well. It is a way of noticing white coloniality and how it stabilizes bodies, how it typicalizes bodies, how it productivizes bodies, how it makes us useful, right? And of course, it comes from a historical consideration of bodies enslaved in um, during the antebellum um, period in um, the United States and how those bodies would often extricate themselves from the labor of the plantation. So fugitivity is a refusal to participate in the plantation. It's, it's marinage, it's spillage, if you will. Um, some of my colleagues and thought um, elders like Fred Moulton, um, speak about fugitivity as this, this leakage, right? This ontology, and by ontology, I mean a consideration of being, this ontology that cannot quite contain itself within beingness. It has to become becoming, right? So in a sense, fugitivity writ large is a consideration of how our bodies are constantly evading efforts to colonize them, to, to um, manufacture them in a final way, to name them in a final analysis, right? Our bodies are constantly spilling beyond control. And that's the thesis of Nahum Chandler's paraontology, which is another, you might call it a fanciful word for noticing that our bodies escape the violence of of coloniality, that when 
the colonial master plants a flag on our bodies and, set, and names it fully owned. There's some little part that is not available for that ownership. There's some little aspect, some molecular minor gesture that is not available for that capitulation to exclusive ownership. So fugitivity, I call it in my work, untold fugitivity, is this rapturous, poetic exploration of a world that isn't still and cannot be still, a world too promiscuous for colonial language. I just came off a call um, with people who are reconsidering the ways that we name rivers. They invited me to speak in their gathering about how rivers and the ways we name them, you know, it's very capitalist, the ways we name things. So they, they want to speak in the, with the language of the apophatic, they want to speak with unspeakability, if you can hear that, um, how rivers can be named. And so this is what I would think of as fugitivity. It's marinage, it's spillage, it's leakage, it's all the energies that we screen out in the efforts to be individuals. It's how we are constantly leaking away from final capture. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Do you want to um, share on that as well, Camille? Or should yeah. I go to the next? Okay. I think that's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. And I and I came in rather than being like a disembodied voice. I hope that's okay. Um, this next question is quite practical, which is how can we build more spaces to grieve in community? Hmm. I since this can happen in many ways um i'm definitely influenced by pleasure activism adrian Mar Mar marie brown's work on this and so i would say moving towards what will have an element of pleasure uh to facilitate touching into something that maybe there might be some resistance to so it can be a resistance to being with grief given that uh so many of us haven't spent a lot of time intentionally with it so for me, I tend to um, move towards dance-based grief rituals. I love dancing. That gives me a lot of pleasure. So that's a container that really works for me. So it could be that if you're someone on the call who also loves dancing um, and you have some friends who enjoy moving and want to explore grief, that you could actually come together and decide that we're going to do a dance your grief ritual. We're going to think about or feel into something that we we want to be in relationship to, that we're grieving and use dance as a way to touch into that but doing that together could be one way um it could be also as simple as having a fire collectively and burning pieces of paper or other offerings as a way to release um i think there are many ways it just will take the intention and a kind of collective container to sort of have an intentional space um, to explore. And I think, you know, there's a beauty in it becoming something that's regular. Of course, we will have to experiment and maybe find the right people that we feel enough trust with, that we feel safe enough with to be vulnerable in that kind of way. Um, but ideally, if it's something, you know, the experiment with a little bit, perhaps you could find a group of people who you might want to meet with monthly and yeah, to kind of do some kind of grief offering together, which could be around a fire, which could be dance-based, which could be a sharing circle where you choose the amount of time um, you want to hold space for each other. And yeah, I think there are lots of different approaches. You're very welcome to check out some of the options in Tending Grief as well. There's quite a lot of group practices in there, but it can also be intuitive. And I know that many of our ancestral traditions have had grief practices, communal grief tending practices that um, some of us might be still connected to, others more separated from. But I think there's a lot of examples of ways this, this can be done, and it uh, might just be a question of experimenting and finding the right the right people to try this with. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Um, this one's also practical, but but in a different way. Um, do you have any advice for those who yearn to begin building relationships with the dead 
beyond what you shared earlier, when some of us are taught that beings are here and they're gone and now that's it. Mm. But maybe who don't know where to start or what questions to even ask to learn how to connect. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a couple of ideas and I'd love to hear what Bio has to say about this as well. Um, I think a very simple way to start is if there's an ancestor or someone in your life that's died that you want to feel a bit closer to. Um, it can be as simple as having a photo of them somewhere visible in your house that you have a candle beside, just intentionally lighting a candle and just spending a little bit of time either remembering them, different stories or moments you shared, or if you feel comfortable even starting to speak to them be questions that you have, curiosities you have, things that you're seeking support with. And being in practice with that, it might feel a bit funny or a bit odd at first, if that's not something you're used to doing. Um, but that could be an access point to begin. If you'd like to be a bit more elaborate, um, you could also create an ancestor altar. And there's lots of different ways to create an altar, usually involving um fabric and candles maybe alcohol that the ancestors might have liked their photos again maybe flowers um and this really being a space that you tend and you go to regularly and this could be a space to again be in communication to um bring questions to connect and kind of almost be feeding trying to rebuild this reciprocal relationship again um, and there's many different traditions and approaches to to that um, but I'd say lighting a candle by a photo and, and chatting might be the the first entry point to explore and just to see how it feels and what comes of that. Maybe I'll just add to my siblings' um, exploration here, just this sentiment. It's not even that we, you know, moderns aren't, you know, having relationships with the dead. I think the pervasive ritual is to visit a lost one at, you know, in the cemetery. You know, it's occasional. It's once in a while. Sometimes people ask, I believe in the, in this part of the world that have you visited? You know, the, those are the relationships that are still ritualized in, in a sense here. But I think the deeper vocation here is to be careful about how we spatialize and locate um, our loved lost ones, that they are not as, you know, it's, it also follows in the tradition of locatability, that they're over there, you know, they're, they're right over there. And so we go over there to what I heard Camus speak about, you know, is the sudden, if you will, pervasiveness of a lost one that that in how she moves in the world how you relate with the world around you you are relating with with loss you it, it's it's not something that is unidirectional it is something that is that is practical but also speculative so i just want to draw out this thread that the invitation here is to experiment with reaching out, experiment with um, with the boundaries you suppose you have, learn to listen, uh, pay attention and be sensitive to those places where failure, where you don't have all your shit together, right? Because at least the traditions that I come from, it's in those places of rupture that an elder speaks true or uh, an ancestor size, you know, that it's the, the world is visited over and over again um, by the new, by the not yet seen, by the invisible. But we welcome these things as pathology, right? We, we welcome them in a sense as pathology. We don't know how to hold the new. And so we pathologize it we stamp the DSM manual on it, and then we archive it. And I wonder 
about loss in that way. So maybe the invitation here is to don't listen to these things like they are standardized responses, right? Be sensitive to your locale, to your, your environment, to what the world is doing through you and with you. And in that, you will find the intelligence of approach. Thank you both so much. Um, another question. Um, I want to bring into being the replacement of the Anthropocene with the Afrocene. Please share some operational strategies. <laughs> Oh, man. Where do you work, sibling? At KPMG? <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure if I... I'm not even sure. Yes, I coined the term Afrocene to... Um, but let me read the question again. That, that I want to work to bring into being the replacement of the Anthropocene with the Afrocene. I know the Anthropocene as a term has been rejected by the stratigraphic authorities. So it's thrown out the gate, but it's still a galvanizing concept and principle, which I'm sure most of us understand uh, speaks to the age of man, of industrial man, and the deleterious effects of our continued engagements with ecology. It's the shape of our experience again. I offered the term Afrocene to move away from, to move one decibel higher on the scale of considerations, you know, that includes the African Anthropocene. So there are scholars who suggest that, you know, it's not just the Anthropocene. We have to take into considerations the, the, the transatlantic slave theft, the, the, the fact that Africans, Black bodies have had to pay an enormous price right, with their loss and their suffering and their grief, you know. So it's not just about carbon emissions, it's, you know, or sequestering. Those are not merely the vocations. We must pay attention to the past that still lingers, right? Like, you know, in the consideration that places like Nigeria, for instance, don't have air quality index or indices, right? You may have that in Paris or you may have that in the United States, but we're so, in, in a sense, left behind. And so these scholars speak about an African Anthropocene. I speak about the Afrocene to suggest <clears throat> and to tell the story that this loss we're experiencing is a strange opportunity. And I don't mean opportunity in the entrepreneurial sense. I mean, it's an opening that this time of intensity is also a moment of thresholds and that the thing to do is to enact a different kind of politics that pays attention. It's a story of issue, sneaking aboard the slave ships to travel with the slaves. And it's, it's generally a story of crisis, that yes, we're in crisis, but crisis as opportunity, crisis as opening, crisis as a kata basis a time of descending into the soil. And this is what Camille is speaking about, grieving together. That's part of the Afro scene. Um, strategies of replacement. I don't know if I want to replace um, the Anthropocene with the Afro scene. I don't even want to make it official. I think it dwells better in the side, right? I don't want to be, I don't want to see part of the UN or I'm not saying that's what you're saying, sibling, but I, I, I don't, I don't want to see it part of the UN or part of UNESCO. I don't want to make it official. I think it dwells in the side of things where it rubs its hands together and it does its best work when it's storytelling and inviting strange kinds of hospitalities. So use it, explore it, bend it this way and that, and that is enough of a strategy as I would recommend. And pay me a honorarium for every usage, $5 per usage. <laughs> I'm just <Perfect>. kidding. <laughs> um, what is diasporic grief? Do you both feel it? When and how? And how can we tend to this diasporic grief? 
Mm. You, you want to go? Sure. Um, I suppose some of this I, I speak to in the first chapter of Tending Griefs. It's called The Ongoing Grief of Colonization. And yeah, I, I suppose there are there are forms of grief that come from from experiences in my family that I know are not localized to my family that are patterns for people in the African diaspora and other diasporas as well but um with my grandma who was born in Guyana and then my grandfather who was born in Nigeria um there are legacies and hurdles and hurts and harms that impacted them that I still feel in my body. I see in the bodies of other family members. There are ways that they felt they had to conform and box in, suppress and sever their own experiences of grief. There wasn't space for them to grieve. They didn't have space for it. There was a kind of needing to just get on, survive, keep it moving, move, move, move. And in many ways, I feel like my or our generations are some of the first that maybe have the resources, the space, and maybe the time to actually engage in some of that work on a different level, because it's uh, for many of my elders, our elders, it was just survival mode for a very, very, very long time. And many of us are still in that place, but that for some, there might be a bit more spaciousness a bit more room, a bit more capacity to lean in and start to kind of tend to what's there. Um, but I think about this, whether it's, you know, the war on drugs and the fact that in Nigeria and many parts of the world before colonization, we had a relationship to plant medicines, to plant ancestors, right? For different forms of healing and sometimes for altered states of consciousness. When the British um, colonized Nigeria, in many other countries they colonized, they implemented laws against witchcraft and juju, which then banned the use of those plants, the relationships to those plants. And so then when you fast forward to the descendants of those that were colonized, who then move sometimes under coercion or under a sense of there are no other options, moved to the West to then be wrapped up into the logic of the war on drugs, where their descendants are pol policed, harassed, criminalized sometimes at 12 years old you know being assaulted by police officers that trauma then leading many to end up in the mental health system and still this this disdain and fear from working with plants from having these relationships that have been such a connection to the earth i mean that's just one thread of the diasporic grief that feels very present for me and in the story of my family and in many other afro-caribbean families in in england and in many places around the world so I mean, some people might think of this as intergenerational trauma. Another way of talking about it is diasporic grief. But I think the, yeah, the movements, the experiences that have not been resolved, that have not been accounted for, that have often not been acknowledged deeply as to how that is held in the body, how that um, continues to shape the way that many of us move. Um, so yeah, that's that's a little snapshot of what I mean. But I'm curious to know what resonates uh, for Bio around the question. Such a beautiful story, and the way you tell it, Camille. Um, what comes to mind for me is the are the historical efforts of Afro diasporic communities. Um, Afro descendants and the African continent, the homeland, right? I'm I'm thinking of, about Martin Luther King and Kwame Nkrumah of Du Bois and and the Ghanaian and African context. I'm thinking about Fela and Nicola Pokuti and Tupac. You know, there's always been this effort to bridge, you know, across the chasm of colonial loss, right? And this was very intense during the heydays of the African independence movements. So black, you know, efforts to bridge this divide, I think would be considered a kind of classical physics, right? We have been divided across um, lines and borders and boundaries by, by loss and 
and theft and pain and suffering. Let's see if we can build a black federation of unity. Let's see if we can build an African union. You know, there's a, there's a strand of diasporic grief that is figured in those considerations of historical attempts to bridge across classical divides. But there's another sense of diasporic grief that I love to explore here. And that is grief as quantum. You know, in the Einstein sense of um, spooky actions from a distance that in a sense that escapes and disrupts classical attempts to bridge divides, we have never really been separated. We have never really been cut off from each other. That we've never really been individuals in a final way. And that feeling is not even a human thing. It's post-humanist, it's animist, right? Um, I forget the dear author, my brain is acting up. Uh, what was that book again? I think it's Teresa. Um, you know, some, oh, I forget the, something about affect. Forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm usually very spontaneous with how I recall these authors. Teresa Brennan, yes. Um, and Teresa Brennan speaks about affect and feeling, not as if they were domiciled within a stable human self, that in a sense, you can feel it in a room. Um, affect, feeling are not products of the human brain. Um, so I speak about diasporic grief to suggest that we are participating in affective capacities and spaces and cultivations that are, are not even ours. We are, we are participating in strange ways across waters, across boundaries with each other, across ontologies, across epistemologies, across cultures. And so there is a planetary grieving that is, that is a fabric of some sort that I feel holds what Camille is inviting us to, tending, or what I would call a parapolitics, you know, that I feel is really powerful for these moments. So that is diasporic grief from a classical perspective, from also from a quantum entanglement perspective. Yeah. Beautiful, thank you. Um, could you speak more on how we can potentially tend to grief and sense together in a disruptive and generous manner that is not turned into another commodity to stitch us back together to function and resells indigenous traditions or renders us obsessed with grief. So how to engage with grief in a way that avoids capitalism's trap? Mm, yeah, this is the question. Neoliberalism is very good at ensnaring and co-opting things um i think for one that grief rituals don't have to be don't have to be in association with money you know this is something we can do on a peer-to-peer -peer level um we you know some people will choose to go to a facilitator and if that facilitator is supporting themselves they may ask for donations or there may be a fee for the grief ritual i'm not against this um if that's really how someone is supporting themselves and they're offering that to community. But ultimately, we don't have to pay for this. We can do this with each other. Um, so that's one piece. And for me, like Bio has said, I don't see grief as an elixir. This is going to fix everything. And I think that's what neoliberalism often likes to, to sell us, a quick fix, or to say, this is the thing that's going to solve all the issues. It's not that. I think grief can be a portal or a gateway to more relational malleability. Um, but I do think it's a practice-based thing. Um, I would really suggest or invite having a regular grief tending practice. I personally have a monthly practice. This is kind of in alignment with uh, the Dagara approach, which has really shaped the way I think about grief. Um, so for me, it's monthly, perhaps there's a frequency that would feel better for people, but to really notice what, what it brings to have this kind of regular moment 
Um, but using that as a site then to move between different states in daily life, to not be fixated on, I have to be in grief all the time, or I have to be numbing and moving away from it all the time, but really allowing these moments of dropping in intentionally to grief to support a fluidity of changing states, moving through different emotions, noticing how we can bring awareness and presence to that if it feels safe enough to do so, and really using those grief tending moments as an opportunity to build more intimacy and capacity to shift social conditions with each other, with people we trust that we wanna move with. And that can be really about the collective, about giving us more, more space to be present with how we share our gifts, with how we can support transformation. Um, and really ideally pairing this with body-based practices so that we're ideally bringing more capacity again to our nervous systems to move between these different states and meet what arises in our days. And there's a lot that's coming up in these times. So hopefully being able to, to be with that with more skill and be more responsive rather than reactive. And uh, as bio is often inviting us to do to slow down can be a way that can support us to slow down. Um, of course, things can be facilitated and, and spun in many different ways, but that's that's my intention with the offering. There may be various different interpretations and ways that people hold it um, in years to come. But I do think ultimately this can be something we can do uh, with ourselves or on a peer to peer level that doesn't need to involve money or commodification. Thank you, Camille. Um, I recently heard a 96 year old woman named Dot Fisher Smith uh, saying, I did not have a good childhood. Lots of being shunned, lots of being pointed at. So I feel like I'm actually enjoying my childhood right now at 96. I'm finally learning to play. I wonder if you have any responses to that. Um, I think that's beautiful to hear mm -hmm. it can be accessed at any age. Um, in my own way, I resonate in that I feel like I'm regressing in some ways. I'm way more playful now than I was as a child. I was a very, very serious child. Um, and I think that's partially to do with some of the things I experienced as a child. Um, and so I'm, I'm delighted to be learning to play more and to be prioritizing that more as I um as I get older still quite young 32 as I as I speak today but um yeah I I don't think there needs to be a kind of linear trajectory for for these processes when we think of healing mm -hmm. um yeah that's what I take from it but interested to know what's coming up for you by <laughs> Just laughter, the, the joyful laughter of seeing an elder, you know, play. Um, my wife and I went on a hot air balloon for her birthday. Um, and um, the person who was manning, it was a first time experience for both of us. And the person who was manning the thing told us that the most interesting, one of the most interesting clients he had was, um, was a 90... No, I think a, maybe even a hundred years old who who went up on the balloon and it was the first and last time. And so I, I kind of recall that joyful memory hearing about this 96 year old mother of ours playing in her old age. It kind of just suggests to me that maybe even death is the most magical of playgrounds, right? And maybe it's not just the modern dream of growing up Maybe we also grow wide, right? And growing wide is this is this cultivating of capacity to be in league and in attunement and in constant communion with the parts of us that have never really been left behind, right? So um, growing up is too narrow. I don't just want to grow up. I want to grow wide too. And I hope that I get to live, you know, like this dear mother of ours. To play at 96. Yes. Hmm. Well, 
we're winding down and um, I wanted to thank you both so much for your time, your commitment to vulnerability, to creating community together. Um, for those who are here now and for those who listen to this in recording, you know, folks often ask how they can support authors. Um, and I think buying both of these individuals' books um, and talking about them. You know, we sometimes get asked, hey, what are you reading these days? Don't make anything up. Read their book and then talk about it. Um, I wanted to thank some of my colleagues, uh, Bevan, Gabby, and Soraya, who behind the scenes have helped make this happen. And Camille, I just wanted to turn it over to you if you had any last words you wanted to share. I just want to, yeah, also give give thanks to to you, Tim, to all the North Atlantic Books team. It's just such a a pleasure working with you all and feeling your care. Um, I wish that, yeah, that could be available throughout the publishing industry, but the more I hear, it doesn't seem to be the case. So thank you for what you're doing, and thank you, Bio, for yeah sharing this space with me and having this conversation. It's um felt very nourishing and heart heartwarming for my tender yeah for my tender heart space and thank you for everyone listening in and for all your beautiful questions um yeah I feel that there are just more and more questions as I engage with this research and I hope we can all uh participate in that you know I really don't see myself as an expert in this I feel like in the in the process of grief tending and I'm very curious and hope to be engaged in more questions and explorations and hopefully having space to do that with you. So yeah, just an invitation to do your own grief research and touch into it in the ways that feel generative. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All have a beautiful evening or night and we'll see you in the whirlwind. <laughs>